This demonic spirit is invading the church. Jezebel in Revelation. We may have heard about Jezebel in the Bible, an evil queen that murdered God's prophet and promoted the worship of foreign idols like Baal. However, we may not be aware of a special Jezebel and her spirit and influence mentioned by Jesus in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation. Although it often describes itself as a prophecy, Revelation is actually in the form of a letter. However, instead of one church, this letter is addressed to seven. While it has a unique message for each, it is evident that everyone should hear all the letters. In Revelation 2, a character referred to as Jezebel is mentioned in one of these letters. This occurs during the Lord's warning to the seven churches. A woman referred to as Jezebel was present in Thyatira, the adulterous church. Thyatira was the most minor and least important of the seven cities Jesus addresses in Revelations chapter 2 and 3. This verse sets the stage for more exploration. In this context, Jezebel represents a type of spiritual deceit and immorality. This figure in Revelation symbolizes a corrupting influence within the church, leading people away from true faith. The book of Revelation contains a series of letters to seven churches. One of these letters is addressed to the church in Thyatira. This letter, like the others, is said to be from Jesus Christ and is delivered through John, the writer of Revelation. The letter to Thyatira starts by acknowledging the church's good deeds, love, faith, service, and perseverance. However, it quickly turns into a serious issue within the church. This part of the letter is found in Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 19. This Jezebel is said to be teaching the church members to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. These actions are similar to those attributed to the Old Testament Jezebel, who led the Israelites into idol worship and was notorious for her immorality. People forget, of course, that the church of the New Testament times had problems too. We find a church with problems that threatened to wreck its life and ministry. Jesus observed many positive things in the church of Thyatira, but there were also many significant problems. The issues were significant enough for Jesus to declare, nevertheless, which can be interpreted as, despite all the good, I have a few things against you. A woman whom Jesus called Jezebel was at the heart of the scandal that engulfed the church at Thyatira. This may not have been her literal name, but a title that unmistakably denoted a self-styled prophetess inside the church, following in the footsteps of Jezebel as described in the Old Testament. The name Jezebel had a powerful connotation. When we refer to someone as a Judas, we imply something strong. It was also a strong thing to call this woman Jezebel. She was one of the most criminal figures in the Old Testament, and she strove to blend the worship of Israel with the worship of the idol Baal. We read, who calls herself a prophetess? This woman pretended to be a prophetess, but was not one in reality. However, it would appear that the Christians who lived there accepted her as a prophetess, which is why Jesus issued this warning to them. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 11, Jesus predicted that this would take place, saying that at that time, many false prophets would arise and lead many astray. These statements were initially delivered with the end times in mind. However, there have always been those inside the church who call themselves prophets, but are not actually prophets. A prophetess is a female prophet. The word prophet comes from the Greek word prophetes, which means spokesman. A prophet in the Bible is a person who proclaims God's word and therefore speaks for God, a spokesman for God. A prophetess was, therefore, a spokeswoman for God. The faithful prophet or prophetess was one who spoke everything God said to speak regardless of whether or not he or she was listened to. There are several prophetesses mentioned in the Bible. In the Old Testament, several prophets were mentioned. Miriam, the sister of Aaron and Moses, was one of them. An unnamed prophetess in Isaiah chapter 8 verses 1 through 4 bore Isaiah's son, Meir Shalal Hash Baz, whose name was prophetic. Jezebel was not like these women. This woman was like Jezebel and was teaching the church at Thyatira to follow idols and leading them into sexual immorality. The world has seen its fair share of false prophets, from the prophets of Baal who challenged Elijah on Mount Carmel to cult leader David Koresh, 
and the Bible predicts that there will be more. During the second half of the tribulation, Satan will give authority to a false prophet to deceive the world into worshiping the Antichrist. Elijah triumphed over the prophets of Baal when the fire of the Lord fell from heaven and consumed his sacrifice. Elijah faced the old Jezebel, but it seemed like no one was there to face this new Jezebel. We read the activities of this Jezebel, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Jesus identified the precise transgression that was committed by this woman and called her Jezebel. She mostly influenced others in an immoral and sinful manner, and as a result, she brought other people in sin. Jezebel led others into immorality. Jezebel encourages sexual immorality, while Paul exhorts believers to flee from sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Run away from sexual immorality in any form, whether thought or behavior, whether visual or written. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the one who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. But sexual immorality and all moral impurity, indecent, offensive behavior, or greed must not even be hinted at among you, as is proper among saints, for as believers our way of life, whether in public or in private, reflects the validity of our faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, that you be sanctified, separated and set apart from sin, that you abstain and back away from sexual immorality. Jesus' most famous message, the Sermon on the Mount, focused on the hearts of his listeners. He targeted his disciples as the audience and preached what we now call the Beatitudes. He called his men to be different, to see the world from God's perspective, and to relate to people in a supernatural fashion. To maintain one's sexual purity requires more than simply abstaining from engaging in lustful activity. It is also something that involves the heart. Lust is a vivid illustration of the kind of sin that Jesus urged his followers to avoid. And in today's culture, it presents a significant obstacle to the pursuit of moral purity. Jesus desires for his disciples to have such a profound commitment to moral purity that they are ready to cut off anything in their lives that tempts them to sin. He's not calling for physical mutilation. Again, sin is a matter of the heart and not merely the eyes and hands. Instead, he's calling for a radical approach to avoiding sin. The Bible contains words of wisdom and instruction that encourage us to trust God for liberation from worldly desires. Flee immorality. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. Everything is permissible for me, but not all things are beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything and brought under its power allowing it to control me. Food is for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will do away with both of them. The body is not intended for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body, to save, sanctify, and raise it again because of the sacrifice of the cross. Paul says, foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. This means that the human stomach has been so constructed that it can receive and digest foods. And yet we should not live for food because they are only of temporary value. They should not be given an undue place in the believer's life. Don't live as if the most significant thing in life is to gratify your appetites. Although God wonderfully designs the body for the reception and assimilation of food, there is one certain thing. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. God never intended for the human body to be used for vile or impure purposes when he created it. Rather, he intended for it to be used for the Lord's glory and blessed service. This verse contains something incredible that should not be overlooked. Not only is the body for the Lord, but the thought that the Lord is for the body is even more wonderful. This means that the Lord is concerned about our bodies, their well-being, and proper use. God desires that our bodies be presented to Him as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. Every believer is a member of the body of Christ, 
Is it proper then to take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? To ask the question is to answer it, as Paul does with an indignant, certainly not. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall be one flesh. Two bodies become one in the act of sexual union. We are told this at the dawn of creation. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. As a result, if a believer is joined to a harlot, it is the same as making a member of Christ a member of a harlot. The two would merge into one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. This is the most perfect merging of two persons that is possible. It is the closest type of a union. Therefore, Paul's argument is that those who are thus joined to the Lord should never tolerate any union that would conflict with the spiritual wedlock. They're supposed to flee. A beautiful Bible illustration of this can be found in Joseph's story when he was tempted to sin by Potiphar's wife. Genesis 39. Then after a time, his master's wife looked at Joseph with desire, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, with me in the house, my master does not concern himself with anything. He has put everything that he owns in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God and your husband? And so it was that she spoke to Joseph persistently day after day, but he did not listen to her plea to lie beside her or be with her. And it happened one day that Joseph went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the men of the household were there in the house. She caught Joseph by his outer robe, saying, Lie with me. But he left his robe in her hand and ran, and got outside the house. While there may be safety in numbers, sometimes there is more safety in flight. Sex outside marriage inevitably and irresistibly works havoc on the offender. He thought we were so valuable that he was willing to pay for us with his own precious blood. How much Jesus had to love us to bear our sins in his body on the cross. As a result, I can no longer think of my body as mine. If I take it and use it the way I want, I am acting as a thief, taking what does not belong to me. Rather, I must use my body to glorify God, the one who owns it. A popular Bible commentator exclaimed, Head, Think of him whose brow was thorn-girt. Hands, toil for him whose hands were nailed to the cross. Feet, speed to do his behests whose feet were pierced. Body of mine, be his temple whose body was wrung with pains unspeakable. This Jezebel led others to sin. Is God more displeased when you cause another person to sin than when you sin yourself? Or are all sins the same? This issue arises when we think of a verse like Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depths of the sea. Is there a greater punishment for someone encouraging and leading others to sin? Answering a question like this is tricky since it depends on what we mean by worse. Worse in what way? If we commit sin and don't repent, we will suffer the second death, the lake of fire. We could say, then, that neither is worse than the other, for in both cases, the end result is hell. Sin is sin, and sin leads to judgment. So, in one sense, no sin is worse than another if we think in terms of our final destination, whether we go to heaven or hell. Yet some sins are worse in terms of their consequences, at least in this life. Worst of the bad. Referring back to Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, it is clear that causing a child who has faith in Jesus to turn away from him is deserving of severe punishment. The term, fall away, in this context refers to abandoning the faith and committing apostasy, which ultimately leads to destruction. Both the one who falls away and also the one who causes the falling away will end up in hell. But surely, the one who incites another to sin bears a heavier responsibility, which explains why a millstone should be tied around his neck. During Jesus' trial, Pilate inquired about his place of origin. However, when Jesus did not answer, Pilate became furious. John chapter 19, verses 9 through 10. 
Jesus reminded Pilate that his authority was from God, but the one who handed him over to Pilate had committed a greater sin. It is unclear who Jesus was referring to. It could be Annas, Caiaphas, or even Judas. However, for the purpose of this text, it doesn't matter. What matters is that Jesus believed that the person who handed him over was more guilty than Pilate. In this context, it is not relevant to bring up Jezebel. Same judgment, different levels. We also read, my servants. This demonstrates how serious of a sin Jezebel committed. She tainted Jesus' servants. Later on in this letter, Jesus would further establish a connection between the work that Jezebel was doing and false doctrine, referring to the latter as this doctrine, the depths of Satan. Revelation chapter 2 verse 24. It would appear that this Jezebel was the one responsible for leading other members of the church in Thyatira to learn the depths of Satan. What about you? What happens if you find yourself leading others to sin? How can I avoid enabling someone else's sin? Enabling sin means giving someone the confidence and power to continue sinning or making it easier for them to do so. When we strive to be righteous, we need to be careful not to punish other people's sins. Relationships between humans can be complicated, and there are many situations where we might get involuntarily involved in someone else's sin. Friends and family are the avenues that Satan often uses to entice us to participate in sin we would otherwise avoid. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Do not make friends with a person given to anger. Or go with a hot-tempered person. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24. However, no one has the power to make another person sin. Sin is a condition of the heart. Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 through 19 says, but the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and those things defile the person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, acts of adultery, other immoral sexual acts, thefts, false testimonies, and slanderous statements. And we are each responsible for the choices we make in the condition of our own hearts. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, But I tell you that for every careless word that people speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. Enabling someone's sin is equivalent to indirectly participating in that sin. As per 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, one should not partake in the sins of others. If there is a command in the Bible, we have the power to obey it. It is crucial to set healthy boundaries for ourselves to live a victorious life, which is what Jesus wants for us. We read of Jezebel giving foods made for idols. What does that mean? What does the Bible say about eating food, meat, that has been sacrificed to idols. This, Jezebel's action affected the unity of the church. In the early days of the church, there was a conflict regarding the consumption of meat that had been offered to idols. This may seem like an odd topic to us now, but it was a significant issue for the believers of the first century. The apostles addressed this matter and provided guidance on various related topics that are still relevant today. In the early years of the church, a debate arose among Jewish and Gentile believers about whether it was permissible to eat meat. Idol worship was widespread in Greco-Roman society. Meat sold in the market was often consecrated as a sacrifice to false gods before being sold. The Jews refrained from consuming such meat due to concerns of unclean food handling practices. They believed that consuming consecrated meat would amount to giving approval of idol worship, a form of second-hand idolatry. The Gentiles didn't consider it wrong to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols as they didn't perform the sacrifice themselves. On the other hand, the Jews believed that consuming such meat was a sin and equivalent to idol worship. This disagreement caused a conflict within the church. By offering food served to idols, this Jezebel is compromised with the world. Jesus rebukes them for tolerating a prophetess who misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. This is a different situation from what Paul was dealing with in Corinth. It seems that members of the church of Thyatira were partaking of the pagan love feasts, celebrated with gross immorality and feasting. Those believers were not simply buying meat in the marketplace. They were actually attending idolatrous festivals and joining in the sin of the idolaters. We also see a similar warning to the church of Pergamos. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against you, 
because you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. We then read, And I gave her time to repent, and she did not repent. The most serious charge that Jesus brought against this Jezebel was that she did not change her ways. These statements allow us to see both the mercy and the judgment that come from our Lord. Having time to repent demonstrates mercy, and she did not repent. Although God allows people time to repent, that time is not infinitely long. This teaches us that whenever God grants us the opportunity to repent, we ought to make the most of that window of opportunity. Repentance has always been the first step toward entering the kingdom. But what does repentance entail? There are two words that are believed to be the same as repentance but are not. The first is regret. Many people have regrets about how they have lived their lives. I'd be astonished if anyone listening didn't have regrets about any of their life decisions because regrets are feelings about what you've done to yourself, what you've done with your own life, and your own decisions. The second word is what we call remorse, which is how you feel about what you have done to others. That, however, is not repentance. Repentance has this unique feature. Repentance is what you feel you have done to God. That's a big difference between regret and remorse. Suddenly, you understand it's God who has been the most hurt, just as the prodigal son realized it wasn't just his father who had been hurt. Luke chapter 15, verse 21 says, The son declared, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Repentance in the New Testament is divided into three stages, thought, word, and deed. I'm going to show you that repentance is always repentance of particular sins. You can't repent of general sins. This entails the following three phases, thought, word, and deed. It entails first and foremost, changing your perspective about certain issues and thinking in God's manner about them. And you come to two conclusions as a result of this. First, God is far better than I had imagined. And second, I am a far worse person than I had imagined. In the world today, it's usually the opposite. When an unbeliever thinks about God, he thinks God is unfair, and he is fair, and that he is superior to God. Have you taken notice of this? Repentance is a change of mind. Metanoia is a Greek term that means to have second thoughts. Meta means change or after, and noia means thought. Therefore, it means to change your mind. It means to think again about how you've been living. It all starts when you alter your mentality when you think God's way. And then you'll realize not only that your bad deeds are pretty horrible, but amazingly, you begin to see that your good deeds are just as offensive to God. The second step is the word of repentance, and that means first to confess sins. In the New Testament, there's no confession of general sin. There are only numerous confessions of sins that are plural. If you are bitter, it's because you have decided to resent rather than forgive what has been done to you. Mankind's most fundamental need is repentance, as it allows for God's forgiveness. By acknowledging the role of your choices in shaping our character, we can take responsibility for who we are. But this Jezebel refuses to repent. Now comes the difficult part of repentance, which is deeds. Repentance starts with a thought and then manifests itself in words. However, it must subsequently be manifested in deeds. When Jesus came into Zacchaeus' house to have lunch with him, the tiny man of the tree, Zacchaeus said to Jesus, Jesus, I've been cheating people. From now on, I'm going to be straight, and I'm going to keep my books honest. I'm going to go to everyone I've defrauded and pay them back with interest fourfold. He didn't say, Today, salvation has come to this house. Repentance is putting the past right. You can't put all sins right, but there are some the Lord will show you that can be put right. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus, John the Baptist, and Peter all began with the word repent. Most people, I'm afraid, think it is a matter of feelings, of tears, of feeling sorry for what you have done, and that may not be repentance. Repentance begins with thought. It then comes out with words, but it must then come out in deeds. Continue with this, Jezebel, we read, because you allow. This demonstrates the sin that the church in Thyatira has committed. They presented themselves as a model church to the outside world by way of their deeds, love, service, faith, and patience. However, there was a tremendous amount of corruption taking place within the church. 
The church's sin was that it allowed this corruption to take place inside its midst. It's possible that Jezebel didn't have a particularly significant following. In the same way that a small amount of leaven may impact an entire ball of dough, a small number of people who engage in immorality and idolatry can taint the entire church, particularly if they wield influence over others in the same manner that Jezebel did. The city of Thyatira was known for being a commercial and financial hub. It was home to a large number of prosperous merchant guilds, each having its own patron idol. Acts chapter 16 verses 14 through 15 mentions Lydia of Thyatira, who was a vendor of purple cloth from the city of Thyatira. Thyatira was famous for the manufacture of a purple dye. Seems like that the sensual immorality and the consumption of foods that had been sacrificed to idols at Thyatira were probably connected with the mandatory social occasions of the guilds. Perhaps a Christian was invited to the monthly meeting of the Goldsmiths Guild, and the meeting was held at the Temple of Apollo. Jezebel would allow or encourage the man to go, perhaps even using a prophetic word. And when the man went, he fell into immorality and idolatry. The guilds and the gatherings they held had a great pull on people. There is no way for a merchant or trader to have any hope of flourishing or making money if they are not members of their respective trade guilds. When it comes to spiritual and moral boundaries, some Christians and churches feel compelled to be all-inclusive. Apparently, the ancient church in Thyatira felt the same way. On the surface, the church's love, faith, service, and patience were admirable. But Christ with fire-like eyes, recognized their deficiency. The one who searches the minds and hearts saw through their facades and into the heart of the problem, immorality. It only took one person, a self-proclaimed prophetess, according to verse 20, to corrupt the church. What does Christ have to say to a church that tolerates immorality? This Jezebel offers things that make godly men weak. Two habits that keep godly men weak. Number one, defiling habits. If we stumble or fail, it doesn't mean our adversary is stronger, but rather that our strength is limited, as the Word of God explains. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10 says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. It's important to note that the verse mentioned is not talking about our physical strength, but rather the state of our inner selves, also known as our spirit. There are certain symptoms that can help us determine our spiritual condition and assess our level of inner strength. The devil will constantly try to affect our spirit by bombarding us with negative images, words, and memories. In Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 34, The Lord is angry with Israel because they set up their vile images in the house that bears my name and defiled it. Bringing idols into the Lord's temple was an act of defilement. Sexual sin of any kind defiles a person as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is a sexually immoral person, or a greedy person, or an idolater, or is verbally abusive, or habitually drunk, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a person. For Israel to commune with the holy God, God gave them many ceremonial laws to show them how to cleanse themselves from defilement. Defilement of any sort, even when caused unintentionally, separates a person from the community and from God's dwelling place among them. Defiled people could not enter the sanctuary of the Lord. Anytime enemies or backslidden Israel desecrated God's temple with neglect or abuse, God considered it defiled. Under the new covenant, born-again children of God are indwelt by His Holy Spirit. Our bodies become His temple. When we defile ourselves through sin or neglect of the Lord Himself, we must seek cleansing by confessing our sins to God. To commune with God, we must be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. In James chapter 4, verse 4, You adulteresses, disloyal sinners, flirting with the world and breaking your vow to God, do you not know that being the world's friend, that is, loving the things of the world, is being God's enemy? So, whoever chooses to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. God used the term sexual sin to describe the worst kind of spiritual betrayal because it is so defiling. Idolatry of any kind also defiles us. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers, and sexually immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. 
When we place more value on anything than on Christ, we commit adultery. In Mark chapter 12, verse 30, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, life, and with all your mind, thought, understanding, and with all your strength. A successful Christian is one who walks in the Spirit so that defilement no longer defines him. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, But I say, walk habitually in the Holy Spirit, seek Him and be responsive to His guidance, and then you will certainly not carry out the desire of the sinful nature, which responds impulsively without regard for God and His precepts. Spirit also encourages a lack of spiritual discipline. When we are totally empty of anything that is spiritual or spirit-filled, we automatically become empty. This then makes us vulnerable to spiritual attacks that intend to make our spirit man fail woefully. We can't afford to be toys in the hands of the devil. Therefore, we must fill up even every empty and idle part of our hearts with genuine worship, scriptures, service to others, and godly thoughts. What Jesus wants the church of Thyatira to do to this Jezebel. Revelation chapter 2, verses 22 through 25. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with plague, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold firmly until I come. We read, I will cast her into a sickbed. Before instructing the Christians in Thyatira on what they must do, he first told them what he would do. Jesus first shared with them his own plans for the future. Jesus would rebuke this Jezebel and send her to a sickbed, along with those who commit adultery with her. He would also punish those who commit adultery with her. This reference to adultery is important. This passage makes reference to both physical and spiritual forms of adultery. When these Christians honored other gods in place of the Lord who had redeemed them, they were being unfaithful to their Savior. As a result of this, the metaphor of a sickbed is appropriate. They committed the sin of adultery. It is as if Jesus said, You love an unclean bed. Here, I will give you one and cast you into a sickbed. What exactly was the sickbed? It's possible that this is only a metaphor for suffering, or it could refer to an actual illness that Jesus permitted into the life of Jezebel and the others who followed her as chastisement. Because of passages in the Bible such as 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, we are aware that when God's people sin, He may punish them by causing them to become ill. We read, unless they repent of their deeds. Jesus explained the reason for this chastening. To begin, the goal was to convince them to seek forgiveness for their actions. Second, it was to serve as a model of holiness for other churches so that they may recognize that I am the one who searches the minds and hearts. The ancient people believed that the heart was the seat of intelligence. This warning was not only directed at her, but also at those who commit adultery with her. Christ was prepared to judge anyone who was complicit in this woman's immorality. If they did not repent, they would face great tribulation. We read, Hold fast what you have till I come. There was a great number of devout Christians who refused to compromise their beliefs in Thyatira. Jesus' only instruction to them was to hold fast. They must not stop doing what is good. They must avoid becoming sidetracked or disheartened by the mission that Jesus has given them to carry out. Jesus also instructed them on how long to hold fast till I come. Up until Jesus returns, we have to maintain our steadfastness and our commitment to Him. Only when it happens will the struggle be won. Not every Thyatira believer was immoral. Some were well aware of God's holy standards and refused to deviate from them. The message to those who did not participate in the immorality cult was to stand firm. Hold fast till I come. The Promise of a Reward In Revelation chapter 2, verses 26-28, through 28, we read, the one who overcomes, and the one who keeps my deeds until the end, I will give him authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are shattered, as I also have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. Christians are able to triumph even in the face of the corrupting and idolatrous influence of Jezebel. We read, He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end. 
We must not let the immorality and idolatry that we see all around us, even among Christians, cause us to get overly disheartened. Through those who triumph against adversity, God's work will continue. We read, To him I will give power over the nations. Jesus made a promise to his followers that they would reign with him. Those who prevail over the threats posed by idolatry and immorality will be rewarded. To them, Jesus offered a share in his own kingdom. The word that is translated as rule literally means to shepherd. I will give him the morning star. He offered them the reward of himself as their compensation because he is the morning star. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. We read, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a letter that should be read by everyone. It is about those who, like Jezebel, tempt others to sin through their actions. This letter is addressed to those who follow Jezebel's teachings and lead others to sin, as well as those who allow Jezebel to carry out her evil deeds. Ultimately, it is also a message for the faithful, who must remain steadfast. All who choose to be faithful, until the end, will be victorious. They would rule the nations alongside Christ during the millennium, and they would be raptured to heaven with him, the bright and morning star, before the tribulation. The story of Jezebel in the book of Revelation shares themes of false prophecy and leading others into idolatry. This Jezebel is likely a symbolic name used to represent a false prophetess leading believers astray, paralleling the original Jezebel's actions. Both stories emphasize the dangers of being led away from true worship and the consequences of embracing false teachings. The letter then warns about the consequences this Jezebel and her followers would face. It talks about intense suffering if they do not repent from their ways. Specifically, it says that Jezebel will be cast on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent. Furthermore, it warns that her children, likely referring to her followers or those influenced by her teachings, will face death. This judgment is meant to show all the churches that God knows people's hearts and will repay each according to their deeds. The story of Jezebel in the Old Testament and the mention of a Jezebel in Revelation offer several inspiring lessons. First, consequences of idolatry and misusing power. Old Testament Jezebel. This is a warning against turning away from what is right and just. The severe consequences she faced serve as a reminder that actions have consequences, especially when they harm others or lead them away from the truth. Standing up for righteousness. Just like the Old Testament Jezebel versus Elijah. Elijah's courage in confronting the false prophets of Baal, despite Jezebel's power and threats, is inspiring. It teaches the importance of standing up for what is right, even in the face of opposition or danger. Warning against spiritual corruption. The Jezebel in the book of Revelation symbolizes false teachings and spiritual immorality. Revelation chapter 2 verse 20. This is a warning against being led astray by false teachings and the importance of holding fast to true spiritual values. Repentance and Redemption The call for Jezebel in Revelation to repent, Revelation chapter 2, verse 21, reminds us that there is always an opportunity for redemption. It teaches the importance of repentance and the possibility of forgiveness, even for those who have strayed far. In simple terms, these stories remind us to avoid wrongdoing. Stand up for what is right. Be honest. Know that actions have consequences. Be careful of being misled. And always remember that it's never too late to turn back and do the right thing. The legacy of Jezebel in the biblical narrative, marked by the promotion of Baal worship and persecution of the prophets of God, highlights the dangers and consequences of turning away from true faith and justice. The severe outcomes of her actions, including the downfall of her house and her own tragic end, underscore the biblical theme of divine justice and the inevitable consequences of wrongdoing, especially for those in positions of authority. Jezebel's legacy also extends to the New Testament in the book of Revelation, where her name is used symbolically to represent false teachings and spiritual immorality, as mentioned earlier in this video. This reference serves as a reminder of the continuous threat of false teachings and the importance of maintaining fidelity to true Christian principles. For modern believers, 
The story of Jezebel is highly relevant. It calls for vigilance against being led astray and emphasizes the importance of standing firm in one's faith. In a world where moral and spiritual compromises are often rationalized, Jezebel's story serves as a caution about the consequences of such actions. In conclusion, Jezebel's story, from the Old Testament to its echo in Revelation, is a timeless reminder of the need for integrity, the pursuit of truth, and the importance of staying true to God. It challenges us to remain vigilant against the influences that seek to lead us away from our core principles and underscores the need for moral and spiritual discernment in a complex world. What is the Jezebel spirit? The Jezebel spirit. There are many different interpretations of what constitutes a Jezebel spirit, ranging from sexual looseness to the teaching of false doctrine, whether by a man or a woman. The Bible does not mention a Jezebel spirit, but it does say a lot about Jezebel herself. The story of Jezebel can be found in 1 and 2 Kings. She was the daughter of Ethbaal, king of Tyre, Sidon, and priest of the cult of Baal. Baal was a false god who was known for his cruel and revolting worship practices that often involved sexual debauchery. King Ahab of Israel married Jezebel, and together they led their people to worship Baal. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31. Unfortunately, the reign over Israel is considered to be one of the saddest chapters in the history of God's people. Her name in Phoenician meant primrose, but in Hebrew, Jezebel meant garbage, and this was how she was known. It was clear that she was using Ahab for her own evil purposes, and he didn't need much convincing. This was the first time that an Israelite king had allied himself through marriage with a heathen princess. Two incidents in Jezebel's life characterize her and may define what is meant by the Jezebel spirit. One characteristic is her obsessive desire to dominate and control others, especially in the spiritual realm. When she became queen, she launched an all-out campaign to rid Israel of all traces of Yahweh worship. She ordered the annihilation of all the Lord's prophets and the replacement of their altars with those of Baal. Of course, God triumphed. But despite hearing of the Lord's miraculous powers, Jezebel refused to repent and swore on her gods that she would pursue Elijah relentlessly and slay him. Her obstinate refusal to see and submit to the power of the living God would lead to a horrifying end. Jezebel's sexual immorality and idolatry were so infamous that the Lord Jesus himself mentions her in a warning to the church at Thyatira. The Jezebel spirit is perhaps best defined as anyone who acts in the same way that Jezebel did, engaging in immorality, idolatry, false teaching, and unrepentant sin, going beyond that is speculation, which can lead to false accusations and division within the body of Christ. The New Testament uses two Greek words for adultery, which almost always refer to sexual sin between married individuals based on their context. What is false doctrine? Doctrine refers to a set of ideas or beliefs that are taught or believed to be true. When we talk about biblical doctrine, we are referring to teachings that align with the revealed Word of God as found in the Bible. False doctrine, on the other hand, is any idea that adds to, takes away, or contradicts or nullifies the doctrine given in God's Word. For instance, any teaching about Jesus that denies his virgin birth is a false doctrine, since it contradicts the clear teaching of Scripture. As early as the first century AD, false doctrine was already infiltrating the church, and many of the letters in the New Testament were written to address those errors. In Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, we read, for there are many rebellious men who are empty talkers, just windbags and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, those Jews who insist that Gentile believers must be circumcised and keep the law in order to be saved. They must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families by teaching things they should not teach for the purpose of dishonest financial gain. Paul urged Timothy to guard against heretical teachings and confusion in the church. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 4, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the doctrine and teaching which is in agreement with godliness, personal integrity, upright behavior, he is conceited and woefully ignorant, understanding nothing. He has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, which produces envy, quarrels, verbal abuse, evil suspicions. 
As Christians, we have no justification for staying uninformed about theology because we have access to the whole counsel of God. Acts chapter 20, verse 27, through the complete Bible. By striving to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, we become less susceptible to being deceived by eloquent speakers and false prophets when we have a solid understanding of God's word. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, so that we are no longer children, spiritually immature, tossed back and forth like ships on a stormy sea, and carried about by every wind of shifting doctrine, by the cunning and trickery of unscrupulous men, by the deceitful scheming of people ready to do anything for personal profit. False doctrine is any belief that opposes fundamental truths or what is necessary for salvation. We are wise to recognize how vulnerable we are to heresy and make it our habit to do as the Bereans did in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, Now these people were more noble and open-minded than those in Thessalonica, so they received the message of salvation through faith in the Christ with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. When we strive to follow the example of the first church, we'll be able to avoid the dangers of false teachings. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 states that the early church devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles, fellowship, sharing meals and prayer. Such devotion will protect us and keep us on the right path that Jesus has set for us. How can I recognize a false teacher or Jezebel? Jesus warned that false Christs and prophets will deceive even the elect. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, First of all, know without any doubt that mockers will come in the last days with their mocking, following after their own human desires. To protect yourself from lies and deceitful teachers, it is important to know the truth. In order to recognize a fake, you must study the real thing. Anyone who thoroughly studies the Bible and is able to correctly handle the word of truth, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, can identify false teachings. One way to identify false doctrines is to study the Bible and judge all teachings by what it says. For instance, a believer who has read about the activities of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 is likely to question any doctrine that denies the Trinity. Therefore, step one is discerning correct teachings, is to thoroughly study the Scriptures. We should also glorify God in our spirit, since both material and immaterial parts of man are God's. The Bible also warns us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands firm, immune to temptation, being overconfident and self-righteous, take care that he does not fall into sin and condemnation. No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience, nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to His Word. He is compassionate and trustworthy, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. But along with the temptation, He has in the past and is now and will always provide the way out as well, so that you will be able to endure it without yielding, and will overcome temptation with joy. They serve as a warning to the arrogant. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Perhaps this refers specifically to the firm believer who believes he can indulge in self-gratification without being affected by it. Such a person is especially vulnerable to God's disciplinary hand. Temptation operates like rocks in a harbor. When the tide is low, everybody sees the risk and evades it. However, Satan's strategy in temptation is to raise the tide and to cover the dangers of temptation. Then he likes to bash you upon the concealed rocks. Then Paul adds a beautiful word of encouragement for those tempted. He teaches that the tests, trials, and temptations we face are universal. However, God is faithful and will not put us through more than we can handle. He does not promise to deliver us from temptation or testing, but he does promise to limit the severity of such experiences. He also promises to provide a means of escape so that we can bear it. Reading this verse, one cannot help but be struck by the tremendous comfort it has afforded to tested saints of God through the centuries. Paul would reassure them that God would not allow any unbearable temptation to come their way. At the same time, they should be cautioned not to expose themselves to temptation. Whatever happens, act in a way that is worthy of the gospel of Christ.
in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only be sure to lead your lives in a manner that will be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I do come and see you or remain absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit and one purpose, with one mind striving side by side, as if in combat for the faith of the gospel. But test all things carefully, so you can recognize what is good. Hold firmly to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Withdraw and keep away from it. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through, that is, separate you from profane and vulgar things, make you pure and whole and undamaged, consecrated to him, set apart for his purpose, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept complete and be found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 through 23. All of our parts need to be preserved entirely, that is, complete and sound. We need to preserve ourselves from everything that would hinder the testimony of the Holy Spirit to the saints' relationship with God. We also need to preserve the body from defilement and evil uses. Let us pray. Divine Creator, we come before you seeking understanding and wisdom as we delve into the sacred pages of your word, the Bible. We recognize its significance in guiding our lives and shaping our souls. As we embark on this journey of exploration, we ask for your presence to illuminate our minds and hearts. Grant us the humility to approach your word with open hearts and minds, free from preconceived notions and biases. Help us to set aside our own interpretations and agendas, allowing your truth to speak to us in its purest form. Let your word be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto our path. We pray for clarity as we navigate through the complexities of scripture. May your Holy Spirit be our guide leading us into all truth and revealing your will for our lives. Help us to discern the deeper meaning behind the words on the page, recognizing the cultural and historical context in which they were written. Give us a hunger and thirst for your word, Lord. Help us to approach it with a sense of reverence and awe, knowing that within its pages lies the key to abundant life. Stir within us a passion for studying and meditating on your word day and night, that we may be transformed by its power. Grant us the wisdom to rightly divide the word of truth, distinguishing between literal and symbolic language, between law and grace, between historical narrative and timeless principles. Help us to apply your word to our lives in practical ways, that we may walk in obedience to your commands and experience the fullness of your blessings. We lift up those who struggle to understand your word, whether due to language barriers, intellectual challenges, or spiritual obstacles. Pour out your grace upon them, Lord, and open their minds to receive the revelation of your truth. Give them patient teachers and mentors who can guide them along the way, offering clarity and encouragement. May your word not merely be an academic pursuit, but a life-transforming encounter with your presence. May it convict us of sin, comfort us in times of trouble, and inspire us to love and serve others selflessly. Let it be a living, breathing testament to your faithfulness and love for humanity. As we study your word together in community, unite us in a bond of fellowship and mutual edification. Help us to sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron, challenging and encouraging one another to grow in our understanding and application of your truth. Finally, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word, which is a treasure beyond compare. May we never take it for granted, but approach it with reverence and gratitude, recognizing it as the ultimate source of wisdom and guidance for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.